Jedinca engleski dvojka je naša. Evo mene ovdje kod Adi. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the ICTY Legacy Dialogues Conference. Uh, I'm really glad to see that most of you are back. Uh, I would just like to remind you uh, that you have uh, an opportunity, and we would really appreciate it, if you could provide your comments, your views on different issues that, we, that have been raised and that will be raised today through the panels. You can do that through the email address, which is provided on the, on the paper that you found on your seats, or you can also put them directly on the whiteboard in front of the Congress Hall. Uh, we will start the day uh, by showing a sh short video feature um, about the, the last 24 years of the tribunal. Of course, you can't fit that in six minutes, uh, but these are some highlights, uh, so I would kindly ask uh, to play the video End of Impunity. Thank you. They said that there never would be any indictees. Nisam kriv i nisam učestvao ni u jednom od djela kojem sam stavljeno u tebi. And then they said there would never be any trials. Malheureusement, nous n'avons qu'une salle d'audience et donc nous devrons la partager avec les autres procès qui sont en cours. Le tribunal est très chargé en ce moment. And then they said there would never be any convictions. Vous êtes donc coupable de général Christitz, de génocide.
and there would never be any sentencing. For the foregoing reasons, the appeal chamber imposes a sentence of life imprisonment. Skoro 25 godina kasnije, Međunarodni krivični sud za bivšu Jugoslaviju s ponosom gleda na svoj doprinos okončanju tradicije nekažnjivosti za ratne zločine širom svijeta. Tribunal je postao prvi međunarodni sud u istoriji koji je podigao optužnicu protiv aktuelnog šefa neke države za zločine počinjene u tekućem oružanom sukobu. I presented an indictment for confirmation against Slobodan Milosevic and four others, charging them with crimes against humanity. I consider this tribunal false tribunal and indictments false indictments. Mr. Milosevic, you are now before this tribunal and you are within the jurisdiction of it. Tokom godina, tribunal je presudio o činjenicama u predmetima protiv više od stotinu optuženih, od kojih su mnogi bili visoki politički, vojni ili policijski rukovodioci. It sends a very strong signal throughout the world that international criminal justice is achievable. Tokom više od 7000 dana suđenja sudije tribunala su prihvatile i razmotrile dokaze o hiljadama zločina počinjenih tokom sukoba na području bivše Jugoslavije. But one of the results of this is that we have um, one of the most completely documented incidents of mass violence in the history of humanity. Više od 4000 svjedoka govorilo je sudijama o najstrašnijim iskustvima svojih života i pomoglo stvaranju do sada najpotpunije usmene istorije raspada bivše Jugoslavije. If people didn't have bravery and courage to come forward, the place would not function at all. It's as simple as that. What we have learned from our witnesses so far is that they testify so their story can be heard, so the world knows what happened. You know, one of its achievements very early on, in a way more so early on, was this narrative for the annals of history. Whether history cared to listen or not is another matter. But the story was told of what happened. Svjedočenja i dokazi omogućili su sudijama tribunala da kreiraju savremeno shvatanje međunarodnog krivičnog pravosuđa. There's been more jurisprudence out of our tribunal in five years than in the past 500 years from international criminal courts. That is quite a remarkable achievement, especially if you think back to the way in which the tribunal was created as a gesture by the UN Security Council, really. Međunarodni i nacionalni sudovi će nastaviti da nadograđuju tribunalovo pravno nasljeđe, a utvrđene činjenice će biti korištene u suđenjima u bivšoj Jugoslaviji još dugo nakon zatvaranja tribunala.
Kada je sud Bosne i Hercegovine 2005. godine osnovao odjel za ratne zločine, mogu sa zadovoljstvom reći da je u regiji prvi počeo primjenjivati praksu Haškog tribunala u svojim odlukama. Uprko skromnim počecima, tužioci, branioci i sudije tribunala nedvojbeno su pokazali da međunarodno krivično pravo suđe može funkcionisati. Neovisno od razvoja političke situacije u budućnosti, ta lekcija neće biti zaboravljena. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first panel for this morning, where we're going to be looking at what we've called the OTP's operational legacy. Uh, I can imagine that at least some of you might be wondering why operational legacy? What is this all about? Um, so really just to try and situate what our objective is this morning, um, what we wanted to do with this discussion was to try and dig in a little bit to the story behind the story with the OTP's work. So we know that you see, of course, the indictments that are issued by the OTP, the evidence that's brought forward in the cases we presented in court. But of course, in order to get to that point, there's so much more behind the scenes that had to happen to enable us to do our, our basic functions as a prosecution office. So it's a little bit like the public sees the tip of the iceberg, and what we want to do here is expose some of the submerged part of, of the iceberg. Um, so things around what kind of strategies did we need to even start to compile an evidence collection? How did we go about trying to convince sometimes unwilling parties to cooperate with the tribunal, both in terms of evidence provision and, of course, arresting fugitives. In the midst of a, a conflict with mass atrocities, how do you go about trying to find a place to start in building cases? And when you do that, how do you build a case against a senior leadership figure? Um, how do you try and access technology in, in the work of a prosecution office when inside the office we had very few resources and very little access to that sort of expertise on our own. Um, and then of course in the more recent years segueing into topics like how do we go about trying to move from prosecutions at the international level into national capacity building for war crimes cases. So yeah, we really want to, to see if we can expose a little bit some of these stories that <laughs> so far haven't really been written down very much in the, the literature, which has tended to focus more, of course, on the jurisprudence and the things that will form part of the, the official archives. Um, and we have, I think, a really exceptional panel in that regard. I was just doing quick tally this morning. I think we would have uh, a combined total of about 60 years of experience working in the OTP um, among the panellists today. Um, so it's really quite significant and of course we have Bob Reed, who is currently our Chief of Investigations in the Office of, uh, sorry, Chief of Operations in the Office of the Prosecutor. Uh, a very significant investigations background, arrived in the OTP back in 1994 and so really has been one of the people most involved over the years in our investigations, in building our evidence collection and also the uh, complex work of uh, the search for the fugitives at ICTY and now in, in our um, mixed reincarnation um, also working on fugitive issues for ICTR. Um, we also have Alan Teager, um, of course known to very many of you as uh, the senior trial attorney on both the Karadzic and Mladic cases, so really no one knows more than Alan the challenges of trying to build a war crimes case and particularly how to uh, develop a case uh, going up the chains of political and military command. Uh, Alan, of course, is also one of the very early staff members in OTP, having been among the very original batch of uh, lawyers who were hired in, in the office. So he has seen our work from Tadic uh, right through to Mladic. Um, we also have Kweku Vanderpoy, who was a trial attorney in our office for many years, with particular expertise in our Srebrenica prosecutions, starting with the Popovich case, also the Ptolemy case. 
um, and Mladic before he uh, moved to the International Criminal Court where he's now a senior trial attorney. Uh, of course, Serge Bramitz. Uh, Serge needs no introduction as prosecutor of the ICTY for the past 10 years and also now, of course, of the mechanism. Um, and uh, it, it's obviously fantastic to have his perspective uh, as, as our, uh, the, the leader of our office over so many years and, and now spearheading so much of the national capacity building work. And uh, finally, but certainly not least, I'm delighted that we also have on our panel Gordana Tadic, who is the acting chief prosecutor of the prosecutor's office of the, uh, the Bosnian court. Um, and, uh, of course, what we really want to also do is not just um, uh, uncover some of the insights from our own work, but look now at the connection between what we've learned and what our colleagues at the national level are now experiencing, the challenges that they're facing and the strategies that they are developing to overcome some of the, the operational challenges. So with that, I will uh, hand over to Bob, who's going to start with uh, telling us a little bit about the reality of investigations in the OTP from the early years. OK, thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be able to uh, speak here today. Um, on the 7th of June, 1994, I arrived in The Hague, the Netherlands, to take up my new position as an investigations team leader in the newly created Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I was one of the first investigators, and apart from the Deputy Prosecutor and a small contingent of 22 seconded lawyers, diplomats and investigators, we were it. There had already been one conflict in Slovenia, and two were raging in Croatia and Bosnia. The international community and others wanted indictments against those most responsible for the crimes that had and were continuing to occur on a daily basis. Not a difficult assignment, I hear you say. So what did we do? How did we commence our investigations? What crimes did we decide to investigate and why? How did it come about that we indicted 161 persons for crimes committed over five conflicts in Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Kosovo and Macedonia, and account in some way, shape or form for all 161. Like uh, the late President Kazesi and Registrar Hocking quoted him yesterday, when I arrived there was very little budget, no standardised guidelines or standard operating procedures, a very small staff who no needed to go to work immediately, limited recruitment had taken place, and we'd see, we, and I, I found and saw uh, a bureaucracy which I'd really never encountered before in my life. So we started by putting in place an infrastructure, guidelines and standard operating procedures, for example, how to take a statement, how to work with interpreters, how to seize documents, what had to be done with the documents once they'd been seized, that is, how to preserve the evidence, and a multitude of other issues that arose on an almost daily basis. We went about recruiting staff from all over the world to carry out this work. Lawyers, <coughs> investigators, political analysts, military analysts, criminal analysts, interpreters and translators, and of course, the support staff that we needed to be able to assist us. We also decided that there was a need to have field officers in the region, and procedures were put in place to set up field officers in Zagreb, Sarajevo and Belgrade. This was eventually extended to Pristina and Skopje when investigations in relation to those conflicts occurred. At the same time as doing this necessary work to get the infrastructure in place, we looked at what had been collected over the previous years of the conflicts to establish what evidence or what information that may lead to evidence we had at our disposal. <coughs> First and foremost, we reviewed the material collected by the UN Commission of Experts under Professor Sharif Bassioni. The Commission of Experts' material at this stage could not be used as evidence to support any of our indictments, but it could be used for lead purposes to locate witnesses who'd been interviewed by the Commission, to lead us in the direction of crime sites, mass graves, detention facilities, etc., and to identify experts who could be used as witnesses in proceedings before trial chambers. For example, Judge Hannah Sophie Grever, who was used in the Tadic trial. We also had to review material submitted by governments and reports from the NGO community and the human rights organisations and individuals writing to the Office of the Prosecutor bringing allegations to our attention. 
So how did we go about choosing the individual investigations? Simply, we went where the evidence took us. After examining the material at our disposal, we decided to embark initially on investigations relating to Bosnian Serb perpetrators involving the municipality of Prijedor, which had been generated by the UN Commission of Experts report, and Vlasenica, which had been generated by government reports and witnesses presenting themselves at the Office of the Prosecutor and outlining allegations in relation to the Sisitsa camp. At the same time, we continued our recruitment process and were quickly able to put together teams that commenced investigations in relation to Bosniak perpetrators, which was the Celebici camp in Konjic, and Bosnian Croat perpetrators, which was the Lashva Valley in central Bosnia. We also carried out an initial assessment of the alleged crimes that were committed in the conflict in Slovenia and put together a team that commenced investigations in relation to the activities of the JNA in and around Vukovar and Dubrovnik in Croatia. All these investigations related to what I term crime-based evidence. This is evidence that is essential to collect to prove that crimes <coughs> occurred on the ground and it is gathered from eyewitnesses the victims or witnesses who saw a particular crime or crimes occur or occurring. It is gathered from internationals and experts in the field, for example, UNPROFOR soldiers and monitors who could say whether a particular military action was proportionate, or doctors who treated victims for their injuries or carried out autopsies on the deceased such as those in the siege of Sarajevo. Without this type of evidence and the proof that crimes had actually occurred, then there could be no indictments to be issued. As this evidence was being gathered, the process of putting the material together to support the indictments was taking place. For the individual perpetrators of the crimes, this was done rather expeditiously, and indictments were confirmed against Dragan Nikolic for crimes in the Sosica camp in the Vlasenica municipality, and against the leadership of the Amaska and Keraturm camps in the Priador municipality, together with a number of lower level camp officials or notorious perpetrators of crimes in those camps and a number of other areas in the municipality of Priador, such as Kozarats and Hamburin. <coughs> Indictments were also issued relating to crimes that occurred in Bazansky Shamats and Birchko. Again, shortly after these indictments in early to mid-1995, other indictments were confirmed by judges of the tribunal against Bosnian Croat perpetrators for crimes which occurred in central Bosnia and against JNA members for crimes which had occurred in Vukovar and Dubrovnik in Croatia and against Bosniak perpetrators for crimes in the Celebici camp. What I've described earlier related to individual perpetrators of the crimes themselves. But how did we go about indicting leadership figures from the political, military and police structures for these crimes and linking these leadership figures to those particular crimes? This is what I call linkage evidence and is the key evidence in any prosecution of a leadership figure, be it political, military or police official. Unfortunately, time doesn't let, give me, uh, does not let me uh, give a detailed response to using this every single investigation that we carried out. But let me give you an example of what we did use, uh, we did using the crimes we alleged were perpetrated by the Bosnian Serbs. We commenced by carrying out what I call pattern investigations. This entailed carrying out investigations in municipalities such as Focha, Zvornik, Bozanski Shamats, Birchko, Banja Luka, Sansky Most, Kluch, Kodavaris, etc. What we found there was exactly the same modus operandi as we found in Priador and Vlasenica. So at first instance, we were able to say that this was not some out of control police chief or military commander who was off on their own personal vendetta, but the beginning of what we were seeing as a policy. At the end of the war in 1995 and with the signing of the Dayton Accords, we were able to get into areas of Bosnia which had been completely inaccessible to us. We were able to go into the areas where we had indicted for crimes and carry out our crime scene examinations, which also included forensic examinations, for example, the exhumations of the graves in and around Srebrenica. We then commenced to carry out what I call search and seizure missions, where we went to individual establishments for example, military barracks, police stations, municipal buildings, political headquarters, newspaper offices and radio stations. And by virtue of a search warrant issued by a judge of the tribunal, we carried out search and seizure missions uh, of documents and, uh, and seized documents and items at each of those establishments. 
We also actively sought insider witnesses who would be able to tell us what was happening as far as the leadership was concerned when the crimes were actually happening on the ground. We also interviewed high-level diplomatic officials, high-level United Nations officials, senior military officers, etc., <coughs> to establish what their interactions were with the senior leadership, what notice the leadership had been given about crimes being committed, and the response of that senior leadership when they were advised of those crimes having been committed. As we were compiling all of these different types of evidence, a clear pattern emerged from the evidence which led us to believe that this was not some random crime which was committed as a personal vendetta or revenge by some out-of-control person, but a policy that had been put in place by the most senior leaders which was then implemented by the regional, municipal and local level in a coordinated manner by the political, civilian, military and police structures. With a few minor differences, all of our leadership cases were investigated in this way, whether it be an individual Bosnian Serb, Bosniak, Bosnian Croat, Serb, Croat, Kosovar or Macedonian. Again, the groundwork involving the investigation of the crime base had to be done, but the presentation of the evidence varied according to the level of the individual accused. In an indictment alleging crimes by direct perpetrator, then eyewitness evidence and, if available, documentary evidence which corroborates the witness must be presented. But in a leadership prosecution, that eyewitness evidence may be presented on paper as long as it meets the rule criteria, alleviating the need for the eyewitness to attend and give evidence. This was especially important in the later leadership cases so that some of the victims, in particular sexual violence victims, were not re-traumatised. As I said yesterday at one of the side events, in the archiving um, side event, the Office of the Prosecutor currently holds 9,226,187 pages of documents, 13,954 audio tapes, 9,465 videotapes, 4,054 electronic discs and 13,975 artefacts. Now, one other area that I'd like to quickly touch on before I conclude is the apprehension of fugitives. Um, as we just saw in that, that uh, short video clip um, with Madeleine Albright, when, like, when I first started at the tribunal, we were told not to get comfortable living in The Hague because we would not see any indictees coming before the trial chambers. We were told that we probably would last for two years and that would be it and there'd be no trials. While we'd carried out good, professional investigations and put together solid prosecution files to have indictments confirmed, we were finding it, finding it extremely difficult to get many of the accused, accused before the tribunal to be tried by a <coughs> trial chamber. Therefore, the Office of the Prosecutor had to devise strategies and work with international parties, parties and the uh, partners sorry, and the individual parties to the conflict in an attempt to have the arrests of our fugitives affected. And from very early on in the tribunal, from about 1997, we had a dedicated tracking team for that specific course. As can be seen by the figures, 161 persons were indicted for crimes which occurred in the conflicts. A number of these persons were individual perpetrators and many were figures in high leadership positions. All 161 accused have been accounted for in some way, shape or fashion. Thank you for your attention. Bob, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the OTP's evidence collection, nine million pages, the, the various um, videos, photographs and artefacts. Um, but the story of what it took to pull that documentary and um, other evidentiary collection together is really extraordinary and uh, it is important that we remember that. I know 10 minutes is by no means um, enough to really explore these issues, but I think it gives you some sense of, of the uh, persistence and the ingenuity that it actually took in order to achieve those results. So I hope we can convince you, Bob, to write some of this down uh, so that it will be available for, for people to really um, understand and use for future purposes. Um, one of the, the things that always strikes me is we, we again talk a lot about um, crime-based and linkage evidence nowadays in international criminal law as if these are standard terms. Um, but of course, this was a concept 
invented in the OTP back in, in the, the mid-90s, <coughs> at the point where we were grappling with the challenge of what would an indictment against a senior leader look like in relation to conflict-related crimes. Um, and so these, these concepts were developed within the office with, um, by people like Bob and others, and uh, now we, we use them as part of our core methodology. Alan, I'll hand over to you to tell us in 10 minutes <laughs> about building a war crimes case. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. That's quite extraordinary and indeed moving to be here after, at this stage of the uh, tribunal's life and after that long journey. Uh, and as Michelle noted, I've been asked to speak about building a war crimes case. Now that, as you would expect, encompasses a vast range of tasks and factors, assembling a multidisciplinary team of experts, identifying and um, locating uh, key witnesses and document collections, actually obtaining statements and, and the documents themselves, uh, reviewing and then continually re-reviewing those documents and statements um, to assess them in light of new information and adapt accordingly. That list goes on and on, but today I'd like to speak to you about only three things, um, three things which unsurprisingly because of the relationship between investigations and prosecutions have already been foreshadowed that constitute the three fundamental building blocks, in my view, of a war crimes case. The uh, foundation, supporting structure, and roof or cover, if you will, and those are the crimes, uh, the linkage, and the objectives. Now, the foundation of any war crimes case, as the very term crime base suggests, are the countless crimes and victims uh, of the conflict. Now, this significance begins, of course, with the jurisdictional element, and that is the establishment of a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population uh, in order to trigger the uh, jurisprudence of crimes against humanity. But the significance of crime base goes far beyond this threshold jurisdictional element. Because just as uh, investigators in domestic crimes scour the crime scene for associative evidence and transfer evidence and trace evidence uh, in order to identify the perpetrators and the cause of the crime, a systematic analysis of crime base evidence can reveal a great deal about how and why the crimes occurred and indeed about who was responsible. For example, as Bob mentioned, um, the crimes may well reveal a pattern which indicates that the crimes were not spontaneous or independent, but planned and orchestrated. Not the result of chaos, but the result of intention. The echoes of leadership policies resound in the crime base and in the municipalities. Back at the beginning of the tribunal, Bob and I understood the objectives and responsibility of the Bosnian Serb leadership on the basis of what happened in the Priador municipality and what happened to the Muslim and Croat communities in that municipality, as he indicated. Now, over the years, the tribunal amassed a vast amount of evidence uh, revealing uh, explicitly, in many instances, the objectives uh, of the leadership that led to the crimes in Priador. Um, and that documentation confirmed uh, what Bob and I had understood long before on the basis of the crime base, which illuminated quite dramatically um, the objectives uh, which were uh, reached and, and uh, uh, determined far away from Priador. So that's the jurisdiction, that's the foundational element. 
After foundation comes the supporting structure, that is, the evidence that connects the accused to the crimes, the linkage. Now, in domestic crimes, that generally refers to direct perpetrators. Uh, and it's found in such things as DNA, fingerprints, blood spatter evidence, and so on. Now, while linkage in war crimes cases can also refer to direct perpetrators, the chain of responsibility in, in war crimes cases often leads to the highest levels of power. That linkage is often established by the proof of, an, of a hierarchical structure that connects the direct perpetrators to um, significant accused uh, far away from the crime scene. But um, the proof of a chain of command must be shown to be more than formal, must be shown to be real and actual. And further, there must be evidence that the crimes resulted uh, from the exercise of that authority and not, as Bob uh, it suggested, from the possibility of acts by subordinates acting outside that chain of command. Bear in mind that linkage may also be indirect, uh, and the uh, connection of an accused figure at the top may go through someone with whom he or she is working at that high level um, who has that direct connection to the perpetrators. As um, Bob suggested, and I think Michelle also suggested, conventional wisdom has it that uh, linkage evidence is um, much more difficult to establish than crime-based evidence. Uh, indeed, one investigator recently described it as a 10% crime base in terms of uh, the investigative effort and 90% linkage. Um, that's a truism, but to achieve the crimes, the people in charge had to communicate their objectives to the direct perpetrators uh, and others involved. And linkage evidence can therefore be found, is therefore embedded in orders and reports and war diaries and daily logs and telephone intercepts and transcripts of meetings and so on. Now, it's the task uh, of the investigators and prosecutors to chip away at the protective barriers that are sometimes raised to um, protect such documents from investigative and prosecutive scrutiny. But it's also the case that uh, evidence of linkage may sometimes be found hiding in plain view, uh, in public acknowledgments by leadership figures that seemed harmless or even beneficial at the time, such as cosmetic orders to obey international humanitarian law, which um, are not intended to be followed, but which would reflect um, their own understanding of their power to order, or in admissions by otherwise hostile insiders who are only focus focused on denying the crime base and don't appreciate admissions about the linkage and chain of command. The final element of constructing a war crimes case, as I mentioned, is objectives. Now, obviously this is an explicit element when you're dealing with uh, a mode of liability such as a joint criminal enterprise, which is conditioned on establishment of the common purpose and the intent behind the crimes. But even when linkage is established through uh, a, a written and direct order to commit a crime, you can expect uh, as a prosecutor that the uh, meaning and reliability of that order will be challenged by the defense uh, on the basis of an alleged inconsistency with the innocent state of mind and innocent intentions of the person who gave the order. Um, now, again, as in the case of the documents reflecting linkage, one might expect that the, that the documents reflecting such objectives would be 
um, as one leadership put it, uh, guarded as our deepest secret. But in fact, they are uh, beyond being revealed in uh, documents which necessarily uh, communicate those objectives in order to ensure that they're implemented. They're also reflected in other ways, in the passionate claims of true believers, uh, in triumphalist boasting uh, at, at the height of power, um, in admissions that are not prudent but that are nevertheless made, when uh, someone thinks he or she has found a sympathetic ear, or even in threats uh, intended to advance the objective. More indirectly, objectives can also be revealed in the logic uh, of uh, statements by leadership figures when they're aggregated. For example, when you assemble claims that uh, another group is your enemy and you cannot live with those people any longer and therefore a separation needs to take, take place, but that you are entitled to territories on which vast numbers of those enemies live and that if your demands for separation are not met, that there will be a war and during that war there will be vast destruction particularly uh, of those people who resisted the need for separation. Assemble those factors and you can see the objectives uh, in uh, Cameo. They may also be reflected of course uh, in the crimes themselves as Bob indicated and in the response to information about the crimes uh, which too often involves praising rather than punishing perpetrators and thus ratifying um, the objectives which they implemented. So those are the key elements uh, of a war crimes case, hopefully in 10 minutes. Um, crime base, linkage, and objectives for those of you currently engaged in the prosecutions of war crimes, please go forward. <laughs> Alan, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously it was an extraordinarily difficult challenge to, to try and say something meaningful in 10 minutes on building a war crimes case, but uh, you absolutely met the challenge. I think that was really a, a, such a useful nutshell overview of the type of work that it's taken to put these cases together. Uh, I'm struck as I hear you speak, um, and I remember a comment from a former colleague who said her reflection back over her time in the OTP, especially in the early days, was just how difficult everything was. There was never an issue on which there was a straightforward answer or a clear pathway, a clear solution. Um, and so I do think it is important to acknowledge in a forum like this just the tremendous ingenuity, creativity and sheer persistence of people such as yourself who've been involved over, over so many years. Um, so thank you for that. Kweku, I will hand over to you. Um, we're of course becoming increasingly... <laughs> becoming increasingly uh, more specific with our issues, having moved from investigations to building a case. Now we're going to look at DNA evidence. We've had an interesting evolution in our Srebrenica cases at ICTY, where initially we didn't have DNA evidence, it became available later on. So all sorts of interesting issues around how does this help us in our work and how do you present it to a court? Okay. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I'll try to be brief. I've got my stopwatch going. <laughs> so, hopefully I'll meet the, uh, the time objectives. Um, Alan said something very interesting to me, and I think it, it bears repeating a little bit. Um, and he talks about, in building a war crimes case, you need to have a foundation, you need to have a roof, and you need to have structure. Um, in the Srebrenica cases in particular, as uh, Michelle has pointed out, that structure was in part built upon or held together with nuts and bolts. Hard evidence, documentary evidence, scientific evidence. DNA forms part of the scientific evidence that was used in that case to establish and to hold accountable uh, the perpetrators of the genocide that occurred in relation to those events. Um, DNA profiling 
is a highly discriminating, powerful, and convincing uh, means of proving identity in a case. Um, it is effective in proving and establishing the elements of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. It's now a vital means uh, to hold people accountable for those mass atrocities. And along with other forensic evidence, in the Srebrenica case, I think, um, I think it's been characterized or, or commented on as being one of the greatest forensic puzzles uh, to be solved. And that was a huge challenge uh, in the tribunal uh, to piece together all of that evidence, the mass graves, primary, secondary, tertiary graves involving deeply fragmented and degraded human remains. So along with other forensic analysis and means of identification, including anthropological evidence, pathology, archeological evidence, DNA evidence can be used to establish the key elements of these crimes, some of which depend upon the number of individuals killed and or the identity of a particular victim group. So it can identify and link human remains. It can identify and link the locations in which these crimes occur through non-human means. So for example, it could identify the same plants that are moved from one grave to another when one grave is exhumed, transposed to another, and then exhumed again, and transposed to a third or fourth grave. You can establish a link across that evidence as well. And it can provide, in, in, in the Srebrenica case, very reliable proof of death and establish the minimum number of individuals presumed to have been killed in relation to the events there. So although DNA as evidence has been used for nearly 30 years, back in the 80s I think it began and has been spread all pretty much around the world, it hasn't and it wasn't uh, used that extensively at the tribunal, at least by the time I got there I think. Um, it had been used I think and presented to some extent in the Militinovich case. Um, it was then used in the Popovich case quite extensively, the Tolomir case, um, the Karadzic case, and the Mladic case. Um, so the question is, how do you present that sort of evidence um, in the circumstances where you might have a court that's not that familiar with uh, receiving that type of evidence and evaluating that, that sort of evidence? One thing is important to do, I think, is to uh, identify the objectives um, that you wish to use that evidence for, first and foremost, whether it's to identify particular individuals, to establish the number of individuals that may, be, may have been victimized by these crimes, or to establish links in the evidence otherwise. Get in there early, preserve that evidence so that you can use it at a later date. It's an evolving science, so things you might not be able to achieve today, you may be able to achieve down the road. And that certainly was the case um, and the experience at the ICTY. Um, a lot of DNA evidence that had been preserved early on was able to be analyzed later on, and as you all know, uh, is continuing to be analyzed even to this day uh, to identify people lost in the Srebrenica events. Some of the considerations we took into account in determining how to present that evidence, uh, particularly uh, before, the, before the tribunal, was one, how to manage the expectations and the perceptions about DNA evidence up until that point. That is how to deal with the complexity of the science, the continuously evolving nature of the science, how to explain to a chamber so that it could understand how this science and uh, method of identification depends in part on interpretive, um, interpretive efforts by the scientists that are evaluating it, um, sort of the realistic significance of the findings. People hear DNA evidence. That means the chances, uh, DNA match, that means the chances are one in a million, one in a billion, and so on and so forth how to convey that to a chamber in a realistic way so that they can actually appreciate um, what we're talking about. Um, also a, a consideration was managing the underlying documentation and disclosure obligations as well as the volume of material that was involved and making available the material for the defense 
to examine and to, uh, to raise challenges if they wish to in terms of uh, accommodating their fair trial rights. Another obstacle, or rather another consideration, was the uh, privacy and confidentiality considerations concerning this type of evidence, because genetic information, of course, everyone knows, is well protected, well guarded, uh, pretty much worldwide. Um, and particularly when that information is provided from a source outside the normal state apparatus of law enforcement, that is a consideration that you have to manage in order to obtain the material and or in order to process the material in, in, in respect of either disclosure obligation, as was the case uh, given the procedural regime that we have at the ICTY, or in the case of a, of, a, of a civil law system, it may very well be the same in respect of material that is produced from outside the state apparatus in terms of producing it in the uh, dossier. We also had to consider the admissibility of that evidence and how a chamber might consider it reasonably uh, in the circumstances. I see I have three minutes left, so I'm going to go. <laughs> Presenting the DNA evidence. Um, what are the strategies? Well, they're basically three. The hard way, the easy way, and the middle of the road. The hard way is to identify an expert that has an overview of this evidence, a professor, uh, someone like this, that can explain all of the ins and outs and complexities of the DNA evidence. The problem with that, of course, is you could explain away the value of that evidence by portraying it in such a way that is so complicated that anybody listening to it would think, this is so complicated that it could create a situation where if there is an error in it, it would be imperceptible and therefore, I'm less likely to rely on it. There's the easy way, which is just to call the technician, call the person who did the test. They can tell you all about it, what they did, how they prepared for it, how they executed it. In a case, though, where you have tests that are numbering in the thousands and thousands upon thousands, that wouldn't be exactly practical. So there's the middle road. And the middle road is to call somebody who has an, uh, a well-founded overview of the science the strengths and weaknesses of the science, but also is connected to the manner in which the testing was done in the particular case or cases. Somebody that could address anomalies in the, ish, in the data, can address the proficiencies of the laboratory, accreditation, all of the issues that are likely to be uh, queried by uh, a fact finder, by a judge, or even by the opposing side who can explain those sorts of things, which is what we did in our case. Explain what is the significance of a DNA match. Does it mean that it's actually the person? Does it mean that it's most likely the person? Does it mean that the person is dead or not dead? What does it mean exactly? Is it final? Is it subject to a, sub, uh, a subsequent determination by a pathologist and so on? Legal criteria in the domestic jurisdiction to declare the identity of the person and the person is dead. So, these are the three criteria which you want to consider and which we did consider. We ultimately went with the middle of the road, which I thought turned out to be the most effective. All right, I think I'm almost there. I've got 20 seconds. You're going to have to give me 30. <laughs> okay. Um, Obviously, in presenting the DNA evidence, it's not just a matter of presenting the conclusions of the evidence. It's also a matter of showing a fact finder how it is that you got to the conclusions. And that entails a certain amount of information provided by an expert, but also entails a certain amount of supporting information that has to be presented to a chamber in order to explain or to substantiate those conclusions. In our case, it involved a series of standard operating procedures which were disclosed from the laboratory, I think in excess of 50 of them. It involved the disclosure of a number of case files. And bear in mind, these case files are roughly 100 or so pages each. And you can imagine in a case where you have 8,000 uh, cases, uh, that that's a substantial volume of information. And so that has to be balanced. Um, and in terms of what is reasonably digestible by a chamber, what is reasonably necessary and to ensure a fair trial, and what is ne reasonably uh, necessary 
um, in order to prove the case, which was done in, 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 in our experience in the, in the, uh, in the tribunal um, to the satisfaction, I think, um, of all involved. Uh, it was the most litigated, I believe, in the Carriage case. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think the Chamber reached a reasonable conclusion on that, issued a number of decisions in terms of his ability to gain access to information that was otherwise considered confidential. That wasn't an issue in Ptolemyr, Popovich, or Mladic, I think, at the end of the day. But these were important considerations. So I won't go into that detail um, because I am out of time, but I would say this. A couple of things. One, it is technology that is available and to the extent that you can get your hands on it, get it. Use it, preserve it, um, because what you can't do today, you may be able to do tomorrow. These cases stretch over a long period of time. It will allow you to make links on trace evidence, fragments of information that could make the difference between holding someone accountable for crimes or not. Um, and I think that was definitely the experience that we had at the ICTY, and I think an important legacy to pass on. Thank you. Gregory, thank you. And you've been very cooperative around the time, so I really appreciate that, as have all of the speakers so far. It's, it's not easy to pack something meaningful into to short time periods. Um, I, I think the, the message that you finished on actually is, is really a key one, so I'm really glad you emphasised that. The importance of collecting, preserving, even if you can't use it right now, and I think that is an important message in many other conflict zones around the world today, where there currently is no prospect of justice or uh, proceedings imminently, but uh, if we as an international community can find those ways to, um, in, a, in a professional way, collect that evidence and preserve it for the future, uh, that is obviously going to be very meaningful. So, so we are now uh, pivoting a little bit from the international to the national, um, and uh, you're going to talk to us about uh, how we used our work at the international level to help build capacity at the national level. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Normally I'm used that at the second day of a conference, the room is half empty. I'm very, very glad that it's not the case uh, today, so um, thanks for, for your interest and for, for being with us. I will speak about the interaction between our officers and uh, regional prosecution officers because uh, it was really very much part of, of my mandate as chief prosecutor. And um, I could, all those, could do all this work with our regional counterparts because, as you can see, uh, I always felt very comfortable having uh, this fantastic team uh, of prosecutors, uh, trial attorneys, senior trial attorneys in, in The Hague. And um, we are, of course, also always very proud if our senior uh, colleagues are hired by other and new institutions, which really shows that the experience of staff from the OTP, but all parts of the ISTY, is really recognized as being the most experienced on the professional market. So on one hand, we are always a little bit sad if we see our best colleagues leaving, but the other hand, we are always very, very proud. So I also take this opportunity to thank uh, the many ICTY staff here and elsewhere for, for the hard work done over many, many years. Um, I will speak a little bit about um, cooperation, capacity building, what we uh, are doing with our colleagues in the region. And um, we all know that this was initially not the plan when ICTY was put in place. It was during the war. Um, we have already mentioned before the primacy of the ICTY over national jurisdictions being a very, very different concept than the complementarity principle we know at the ICC. But where we are over the years in a situation where today we use much more complementarity than probably the ICC will, will ever use because of the dynamic, because of the time. And one element being really important that time changes dynamics. What was a problem 15, 20 years ago is not a problem anymore today, and this has as a result that a strategy in terms of cooperation can really change over time. 
Uh, now, um, we're not going to details about the many things you know about the 11 bis cases and the country 2 cases, which were very much, as you know, the result of the completion strategy decided by the Security Council, which was very much supported, uh, and the, the proposal even came uh, and was very much supported by, by our judges, saying, well, we, we need to see an end of the existence of the tribunal, and we need to find a compromise between keeping the main cases at the ICTY, but making sure that the remaining cases are sent to the region, knowing that in the meantime, the region had the resources, the capabilities, to conduct those cases by themselves, uh, with a different political dynamic, uh, different governments in place, and we all know that the number of 11 bis cases, six 11 bis cases were, were transferred, um, and uh, as OPT, we transferred to these so-called country to two cases, which was investigative material, which uh, had not been, uh, been used at the tribunal. So this was one or the first form of direct cooperation with the region. And very quickly afterwards, the second uh, dynamic which would put, was put in place was really how to access documents. Uh, as you all know, for, for local prosecutors, it's uh, the same challenge as for us, how to access documentation to be used in uh, domestic trials and where um, my predecessor already uh, organized the remote electronic access to our database, this database within the OTP of nine million pages of documents in relation not only to, to evidence and testimonies, but many expert reports, uh, ballistic reports, uh, forensic evidence, DNA evidence, uh, linkage evidence, which uh, has been used extensively by our colleagues uh, in the region. And we are really trying to to use this evidence now that we are in this transition from ICTY to the MICT uh, to, to really go again through this uh, data collection to see if there is additional information we have missed, uh, perhaps additional information we initially used in an indictment but uh, was taken out of the indictment uh, with the possibility of still having cases ongoing at the national level in this regard. Uh, we are working with the ICRC uh, to, to help locating missing persons. Um, this is still one of the important issues high on the agenda with more than 8,000 people missing with the international community moving a little bit away from this, this, uh, this issue where we are always calling for attention to this specific area because it concerns all parties to the conflict. So direct access to information has been very, very important. Uh, another project we are very, very proud of, I remember uh, when uh, I came in in 2008, we had our first Brioni meeting, uh, which uh, we have since then every year where all prosecutors are, are coming together and being myself an um, operational prosecutor from, from Belgium, my first question to the, to the chief prosecutors in Brioni was what else can we do in The Hague to make your life easier? And the answer from uh, the then chief prosecutor uh, from, from Croatia, uh, Chief Prosecutor Bajic, was to say, well, Access to information is very important. Uh, we have difficulties in sending every week or every second week a team to, to The Hague. We, we want a, a better system in place. And so we put this joint project uh, before the European Commission, the three chief prosecutors in our office, to have liaison prosecutors integrated into our office. We are really the first and only tribunal which has put this system in place, uh, where we are very happy about. Uh, last year alone, more than 120,000 pages were taken out of our databases by those liaison prosecutors to be used in national proceedings. Really a very successful project, and we are very pleased that the Commission has agreed to finance that project also for the next few years within uh, the MICT, um, uh, with the support, of course, of my, my colleagues, partners in uh, the region. Linked to this project of the liaison prosecutors, we had suggested to have the stay of interns from the region financed. You know, this was also one of my, uh, you know, one of our conclusions when, when uh, I remember when I, when I had the first meeting uh, with interns, and we had two groups of 40 every year. Well, there were interns from Europe, from the US, from Australia, but there was not one single intern from the former Yugoslavia. And I was quite surprised, if not to say shocked, to say, well, I'm happy for any young lawyer from around the world to join our office because, you know, this, this is important. But our primary target group should be our colleagues in the region. And there we were also very pleased to see that the European Commission was supportive. And we had, over the last eight years, 110 or 120 young lawyers from, from the region. And we have really seen that uh, four young lawyers coming to The Hague for this period is 
a game changer for themselves in their mind, having sometimes been educated in a context where ICTY is seen as very political, but seeing at the end of the day that despite all the mistakes we are also doing in our job, being uh, uh, only you know, normal professionals, they've seen that, well, those are 65 different nationalities, everyone trying to work as good as he can, and no one, of course, having a political uh, dimension or uh, uh, giving any additional information to the conspiracy theories which are very common in this and other parts of the world. So very, very important program, I think, the liaison prosecutors and the young uh, professionals. Um, what are um, the lessons learned a little bit for, for the future? Um, first, I think, uh, if we look at uh, other international tribunals and the challenges they have, capacity building should be an objective since day one. This is really something we are saying to our colleagues, uh, which are starting new tribunals like in Central African Republic uh, or, or other places. Well, capacity building should be, at the national level, should come in at the same time as you start the uh, international project. And, and I forgot to mention that uh, we are currently receiving many, many requests from around the world to provide capacity building based on our experiences. We had uh, capacity building training three weeks ago in, in Kigali for 40 prosecutors from East Africa on conflict-related sexual violence investigations. Uh, we will give a training to 300 military officers uh, in Mexico in November on command responsibility because we are, in fact, the only international tribunal, and you have seen it in the speeches of our colleagues, which had to deal with regular armies, with armed groups closer to organized crime groups, to paramilitaries, to very formal structures, to very loose structures, and uh, this is an experience our colleagues have had, which is extremely useful and important for colleagues uh, around the world. So, lessons learned for the future is uh, definitely trying to integrate capacity building from, from the beginning, um, and to try, if politically possible, to create a system of positive complementarity, which is a term which is used very much also in the context of the, the ICC, which is receiving a lot of interpretation, but fact is that already for a number of years, we are receiving much more requests for assistance coming from the former Yugoslavia than requests sent from our side. We have transferred a number of cases to be conducted at the national level because we trust in the work our colleagues, prosecutors are doing which is one of the big challenges for the ICC because there is no system of transfer of cases where the ICC, from the ICC, the national authorities, for example. And I've said it in another context um, uh, recently that while the ICC is, of course, a, a permanent tribunal and has not the completion strategy obligations we have, well, de facto, the ICC has opened more than 20 situations, but so far never closed any situation. So the ICC has to look for a completion strategy or an exit strategy in relation to each individual situation. And this can only happen if the country in which this investigation is taking place is in a better situation today than when the, situa than when the investigation started. And the unfortunate reality for many cases where the ICC is working is that now, 15 years later, DRC and others, the situation is not better at all. So what does it mean? Additional, inf additional situation for the ICC and never closing any other. So it's a very complicated issue uh, I wanted to mention. And final point, uh, I see I'm also at 10 minutes. And the final point is that I think we really have to review the way trainings are, are given. We have seen over the years that organizing again trainings and trainings, bringing in fantastic people from around the world to provide training which is not really based on a neat analysis, a serious analysis of existing on non-existing national legislations is a nice training, but it's not an effective one. And what we have seen in a number of trainings we have organized more recently is that we do first a need assessment, we look at the legislation, and we do a peer-to-peer -peer training where colleagues are, are working much more intensively together, or as we have done with the liaison prosecutors or interns, to bring them for several months to our office, we think that this is a much more effective way of uh, increasing capacity is to have this much more direct interaction with colleagues, as I said, on a, on a needs assessment than uh, having nice trainings everybody likes to, to attend. I finish there, and I thank you again very much, and I'm looking forward to our cooperation with my prosecutors. 
and with all of you in the coming days and years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I think you have um, pulled together really well the lessons on this topic for the future and as certainly the peer-to-peer -peer model as the, the most successful model we've seen deserves emphasis. Uh, Kweku, you might recall, I think, uh, as someone working on the Srebrenica cases over the years, um, of course when uh, Srebrenica cases were then dealt with here at the national level, we had great synergy between the team in The Hague and, and the teams working here in Bosnia. Really the opportunity to call any time on concrete issues arising in the cases. So we've seen how valuable that can be and just more generally the importance of sustained follow-up. So the one-off training model has, uh, has presented challenges, but if we can back it up with sustained follow-up, we, we've seen real success. I hand over now to Mrs Tadic and um, we look forward to hearing about some of the challenges being faced at the national level, uh, operational challenges in your work. Thank you. Good morning all. I would like to compliment my colleagues uh, from ICTY for their perseverance, results achieved and the legacy they will be leaving behind for all of us and for the benefit of the work of judicial institutions of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the region, but also across the globe. I prepared a presentation, but I have to admit that after everything I've heard this morning, I will simply try to explain how the Office of the Prosecutor of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Judiciary of Bosnia-Herzegovina collaborate with ICTY at the moment, and I will eventually speak about how we're planning to use the legacy left behind ICTY in the future after the decision that ICTY would end its work. It was quite clear that a judicial mechanism had to be created in Bosnia-Herzegovina to prosecute war crimes cases that have not been prosecuted by ICTY. For that reason, the Office of the Prosecutor of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, were established in early 2003. In mid-2002, the necessary laws had been adopted, establishing the legal framework for the work of the Prosecutor and the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. At first, there were only four prosecutors working at the State Prosecutor's Office with a number of international staff members, including prosecutors. Over the past few years, the capacities have been improving so that currently the state prosecutor includes 237 staff members, of whom 59 are prosecutors. I was introduced as the acting chief prosecutor. I have to add that I've also been in charge of the special war crimes department within the Office of the Prosecutor for the past four years, so I will focus in my intervention on the work of that department. Prosecutors in the office are allocated within three departments. In addition to this one, we have a special department for organized commercial crime and corruption, tax evasion and terrorism, and department three, which is a separate department dealing with all other crimes that are not normally covered by the first two departments. The Special War Crimes Department always engages approximately one half of the total number of prosecutors. Currently, 30 prosecutors are engaged in the War Crimes Department. Our prosecutors have been trained, and this training included study visits to ICTY. We've had training in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And our prosecutors are prepared for any kind of most complex cases of war crimes. They work together with teams that include various um, advisors, investigators, case coordinators, analysts, interns, psychologists, as well as various other technical support staff. So here we can actually see 
how staffing and capacity has been developed since 2003, and we have to say that gender balance has been observed. We have approximately the same number of uh, male and female prosecutors. The same balance was maintained in all the different staff categories, but this is particularly so in the war crimes department. In addition to dealing with the prosecution of the most complex cases of war crimes, the state prosecutor is the only office responsible for exhumation. At the moment, we work on exhumations in two ways. The first one is that exhumations are conducted in collaboration with the Missing Persons Institute and the International Commission for Missing Persons. And the second is that we review the uh, storage facilities where remains are stored. We have a wealth of experience. We've also used the legacy of ICTY. In addition to working on exhumations in all the parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina, we in Bosnia-Herzegovina also have 11 ossuaries. Those ossuaries contain mortal remains of persons found so that the ossuary review includes DNA analysis and identification of individuals whose remains are found in the ossuaries. We have excellent cooperation with families and the associations of missing persons because it may happen that we are looking for somebody in mass or individual graves while their remains have, in fact, been in ossuaries, but they hadn't been identified, although we have achieved good results in this area. 20,000 persons have been identified, but seven persons remain unidentified still. For those for wh whose loved ones have not been found, we will never be considered successful in any way, we or any other authority dealing with these issues. So, although exhumation cases are used as evidence in criminal proceedings, we of course work with uh, the most complex cases of war crimes. We also expanded our scope so together with victims associations from all parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina and of all ethnicities, we are very active in finding missing persons in Bosnia-Herzegovina and in the region. And now I want to say something about the fact that so far we've indicted 708 individuals. In our cases, we've heard tens of thousands of witnesses in, through the main hearings in, Bosnia, uh, in the state court. More than 9,000 witnesses were heard. Every sixth witness testified with protection measures as prescribed by either ICTY or the court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. This is also a form of cooperation imposition of protection measures, removal of protection measures for the purpose of our cases and trials before the court. We have excellent cooperation in that respect as well. This is um, coordinated through our liaison officers who are in The Hague at, as we speak as well. We are maintaining this presence because it's a very important project for us. I would like to underscore that these results notwithstanding, the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina delivered sentences with more than 2,000 years of uh, prison. We are fully capable, we and the court, are fully capable of 
working with adequate quality and continuing to work with adequate quality in all these cases because that is the primary interest of us, the legal community and all our communities in order to maintain peace and stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina. However, despite all this, uh, Prosecutor Bramets uh, covered Category 2 but the prosecutor of Bosnia and Herzegovina managed to complete the most complex cases of, from Category 2 that we received from ICTY. Despite all the results I've uh, presented, we've also had certain problems. Problems that we are doing our best to overcome but as Bosnia Herzegovina has a state level strategy for prosecuting war crimes cases, the uh, state prosecutor and all the prosecutors in the country are obliged to follow the strategy in their work. However, there's still a huge number of uh, pending cases and cases that have not yet been resolved. We have our own database. It was established through the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council with the help of various donations. We have excellent, an excellent database for all the prosecutors. We use the EDS base uh, managed by the ICTY. All our prosecutors have full access to the database and also our legal advisors and investigators have access. The Work with the database is a daily form of cooperation. We also, as I said, have our own database. And I checked the database yesterday. And I just wanted to use the data to look at the magnitude of the task still ahead of the state prosecutor, but also the entire uh, criminal justice system in Bosnia and Herzegovina and to understand the significance of the legacy of ICTY and the establishment of the mechanism in the near future for us to be able to use it in our future work. At the moment, we have 642 KT cases. These are cases with the known uh, perpetrators, 1,669 cases based on certain events, and this also includes exhumation cases and 612 KTN cases, i.e. cases with unknown perpetrators. From this, we see the number of cases and the number of individuals that Mr. Bramert referred to yesterday. And I took the latest data from the database yesterday. This is 4,861 persons with known perpetrators. When speaking about unknown perpetrators and events, we are in fact speaking about a much higher number of perpetrators but we also have these unknown perpetrators included in this list, so we have to work on both uh, categories of cases equally. In light of this situation, it became evident that we had to start working on changes to the state strategy for prosecuting war crimes cases because there was a huge number of pending cases with the state prosecutor. Although we do have the capacity, I told you about the number of prosecutors, that we apply all the standards developed by ICTY, we simply had to amend the state strategy At this moment, this work is underway to allow for less complex cases to be disposed of and to be deferred to cantonal and municipal prosecutors' offices so that we also allow a faster flow of cases between the different uh, prosecutors in the region. Allow me to emphasize that we 
have had support from the OSCE throughout our work and we've also had adequate funding through the Council and the mission of the European Commission. We will soon have a new building, so we'll have better physical um, facilities for our work so that we can continue the good work that we started and established thus far. The state prosecutor and the court, as I said, apply all the standards developed by ICTY. We've also accepted the category of uh, joint criminal enterprise, that we've worked on crimes against humanity cases, that we've worked on witness protection measures, that we have invested a lot of effort to work on crimes containing elements of sexual violence, and this is what we discussed uh, in the panels yesterday. In light of this situation, we have judgments. I see that we have uh, legal counsel who appear before us here in this room. Their contribution is also considerable because without this segment, we would not have been able to achieve the kind of results that we've had in this segment, but also in all the other segments of our work across Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, Regional cooperation is an important issue. It is quite important for us, and that's also a part of our national strategy. Countries in the region do not apply all the ICTY standards, but all the countries in the region do have their own legislation, and this is uh, something that's quite um, acceptable for us, and I think that we can and simply have to overcome this problem. We've already had some contacts and we've had some projects through the UNDP and also as uh, uh, Mr. Brametz mentioned, we have regular uh, meeting at uh, Brioni with our prosecutorial meetings, but we have to devise ways of overcoming the impunities as a possibility to make sure that war criminals are sanctioned wherever they may be in the region or in the world. And this is something that we can do, ensuring that every one of us apply standards and rules accepted um, and developed previously by ICTY, as well as our own legislation. That is a way for us to work on a par and overcome problems with Croatia, with Serbia, and with Montenegro. And I hope that in the near future, results will appear in this area as well, and that we'll be able to establish the best possible mechanisms for overcoming these problems. This is primarily in the interest of the state prosecutor of Bosnia-Herzegovina, because most of the cases uh, relating to persons with dual uh, nationality are inaccessible to us. They live in countries in the region or in third countries. You could see in the media reports that we've had quite a few extradition cases from around the world, and all such persons have, in fact, been indicted and uh, proceedings are underway. In this, we are supported by, as I've already mentioned, the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I must also emphasize the work of district and cantonal prosecutor's offices, as well as the prosecutor of the Bertko district. They've also been trained and they're capable of working on such cases technically and professionally, and as I said, in the near future, as our national strategy changes, part of those cases will be um, 
deferred to those prosecutors so that we can focus on the most complex war crimes cases. We also analyzed all the war crimes cases and more than 300 cases are considered most complex. We've prepared a work plan. Every prosecutor has been charged with a number of cases and in the near future we'll be setting up teams, which is what we used to do in the past, so that in this segment we will reinstate the Srebrenica team, which was also mentioned today, and we'll be relying on ICTY's experiences. In light of these complex tasks uh, before the state prosecutor and prosecuting war crimes, the legacy uh, generated by ICTY in terms of evidence, procedures, standards, indictments and judgments will be a priceless pillar in our work, which is why we need to devise mechanisms to utilize the legacy. This is something that I will certainly leave on all of us to think about how we can build mechanisms to ensure that we use the legacy, which we are in fact using already in our work. At the same time, I would like to thank all those who support the work of the Office of the State Prosecutor, as well as all the judicial institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as international stakeholders, because assistance is needed in the near future, not only in the field of war crimes, but also in all other cases that this Office of the Prosecutor is competent for in order to ensure stability and peace and promote reconciliation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is something I firmly believe in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, we really see the uh, complex environment in which you work and uh, the volume of the cases. I think you said 708 indictments. It's, of course, far more than anything has been, that has been done by any international court. We are uh, at the end of our session, but I think we can beg just a few minutes to do a quick round of questions if anybody has a pressing question that they want to raise. Yes. Thank you. First of all, apologies to everyone for keeping you from coffee, but I, I think this may be an important question. Um, ICTY had a huge caseload and very limited resources. The Bosnian prosecutor has a huge caseload and limited resources. Obviously, victims are victims and all deserve justice, but de facto, you have to prioritize. I mean, what lessons from the ICTY do you have on prioritizing cases? do you have that you can pass on as experience to the Bosnian prosecutor, other prosecutors in the region and elsewhere? I just had a very quick question for Alan Robert about uh, linkage evidence. And I was just wondering with the uh, appeals in cases like the Godovina case, which seem to have a slightly narrow view of command responsibility, is that going to impact on the way that uh, linkage evidence is collected and used in trials in future? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, there's a saying, it's not a shame not to know, it's a shame not to ask. So I want to ask a short question. In Croatian Association of Camp Inmates, we have a disagreement uh, about the same events being labeled differently. So what is it about? If Croats are perpetrators, it's a crime. If Croats are victims, it's an incident. So let me uh, give you a practical example. Gdetel is a camp while the museum in Jablanica is an assembly center. So why are there such disagreements or why is there such confusion? Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, well, I'll take some responses from the panelists. Serge, let's start with you. What are the priorities how to do case selection? Uh, if I would say, uh, after 10 years in office, what is the most difficult and the most frustrating, it's probably to be obliged to choose between very grave and even graver crimes. You know, all of us who are coming from national jurisdictions, the each single case, and we have thousands of them, would in a national system have as a result, in Belgium, for example, that you would have a, a, a task force for, for one murder case or one rape case, you would have obviously a task force with all the necessary resources uh, and the expertise to bring this case forward and the public opinion would expect that you resolve each single murder case. Impossible to imagine in any country uh, or in the majority of countries that you would say, well, I don't have the resources to work on this double murder case or, or this child which has been abducted. I don't have the resources to work on it. At the international level, of course, this problem is, is huge. Uh, we have all learned at international tribunals that we have to select and the criteria is we go for those who bear the greatest responsibility. And that's why I said it's so important to have this interaction with the, the national uh, level where the crimes have been committed or other countries who can prosecute those cases to just reduce somehow the impunity gap. But even once you have decided who among the potential perpetrators you want to prosecute, you have to look into what individual crimes are you selecting in each individual case. I remember after the arrest of Karadzic and Mladic, we had this big debate. We had to reduce the indictment to have it more manageable, if I may say, and it meant taking out a number of municipalities, a number of crimes, and it's extremely difficult. Uh, are you deciding based on number of victims? Are you deciding based on the evidence available, the strength of the evidence? Are you selecting based on the direct linked evidence which is linking uh, a crime which less victims but directly to the, to the main perpetrators? It is very, very, very difficult. And we spent many hours uh, with victims' organizations to explain um, the, the issue. And uh, without going into a new debate, if you look at the ICTY and the ICC, at the ICC, especially in the, in the first years, the tendency was to say, well, well, let's go for very small cases with very limited number of perpetrators, uh, hoping that we achieve quicker results. And it did not really work in all cases. And uh, we have at least the advantage, having collected very, very broad evidence in the early days, that we can provide all the support to national jurisdiction in a much uh, a broader sense that it is probably possible for the ICC today in those many situations where obviously the number of evidence collected was much more reduced. But it is a, a difficult problem and every single tribunal has to find a little bit its own solutions for addressing it. So thank you. Um, Alan, perhaps a final comment from you. Oh, okay, well, I will I'll try to do that quickly. I know I know everyone's uh, trying to leave. With respect to prioritizing cases, um, and I think uh, Serge summed it up very nicely, I would only add two semi-practical additions, I guess. Um, in, first of all, it's, it's a critical moment when a concerted effort is devoted to the, uh, to rec recognizing the need for prioritization and actually undertaking a systematic review that honors that principle. And in the course of that, um, I would suggest that one of the factors is efficiency of prosecution um, and, and how much bang you can get for your buck with a particular prosecution. And I would only caution people engaged in that process to distinguish that from the path of least resistance, from a, a sort of an opportunistic selection of a case because it seems to be the easiest way to go because cases inevitably, I think, take more time and, and, and consume more resources than one can imagine. So it's useful to avoid that. Um, and I think I would also juxtapose the, I mean, inevitably, the kinds of prosecutions we must do are symbolic. It's not the kinds of justice one expects from his, his or her domestic system, where you report a crime and it'll be investigated and prosecuted if possible. We know the justice we deliver is inevitably going to be symbolic because we can't do everything, and that applies to state um, uh, institutions as well, trying to undertake 
war crimes prosecutions. And in that regard, <clears throat> some level of, uh, of balance needs to be applied if, if in, in fulfilling the um, requirement of uh, proper symbolic and representative prosecutions. And there you have to avoid the need for tokenism or expediency. And, and that's, a, that's a difficult balance to strike. Um, as far as the linkage question was concerned, I would say that Gotovina was not primarily a command responsibility case. It's primarily a JCE case. Uh, then I think what uh, ensued is that after the, um, the, the appellate decision regarding JCE, which I won't go into, um, I, I don't think the command responsibility aspects of the case at the appellate level for various reasons uh, received the kinds of attention that uh, it would have if that had been the focal point of the underlying trial. And finally, with respect to the question about um, uh, the categorization of crimes versus incidents dependent on nationalities, um, I, I, mean, I feel, I, I feel the, the, the the, the pain uh, uh, behind that question, I, I would only suggest this, is that f if you were to juxtapose results for various cases for any of the national groups involved, I, I am confident, unhappily, that you could find circumstances where crimes against um, uh, a particular victim group in a particular location were not vindicated, while crimes against the group associated with the perpetrators in another location were vindicated. In other words, I'm sure everybody has that complaint. On the other hand, if you flip that around, you would see that crimes against every victim group were vindicated um, uh, at, at some level in different places. I would only say that underlying all that is the fact that all of these investigations and prosecutions were undertaken in the ICTY and I believe are currently undertaken at state levels by professionals who are doing their utmost to um, uh, professionally, impartially, objectively follow the evidence where it leads and bring the proper results and for accountability and an end to impunity. Thanks, Alan. And Mrs. Stardic. Thank you. Regarding the last question by Mr. Kvesic, with whom we have had very good cooperation because he's a representative of an association, I wish to say that the Prosecutor's Office of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, treats equally suspects and indictees coming from different ethnic groups as well as uh, victims. Uh, regarding this specific question, I know what it is all about because there was a a clumsy statement by a colleague who doesn't work with us any longer. About whether it was a camp or an assembly or collection center. And they, there were some sanctions followed. And I do believe that the prosecutor's office of Bosnia and Herzegovina has uh, worked and will work like this in the future because without doing that, we will not achieve results together or we will not achieve reconciliation. And something that was not your task is our task. And I believe that victims who had suffered so much have been very courageous. They live together. They work together, they attend meetings together, and this is what we will keep doing in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is a very important note for us to end on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a quick reminder that if you have suggestions for our conclusions and recommendations uh, document that we're compiling in relation to this panel, please send them through to the email address provided. There's also a board in the lobby, if that's easier for you. And before we take our coffee break, please uh, join me in thanking one last time the panellists this morning.
just uh, thank you very much. Just an announcement. Uh, please, if you could return to the conference room at, uh, by 11.40. That's one. And then the other is that we have a panel at 13.30, uh, launch of the book of Professor Mr. Sheriff Bassiuni. And the panelists will be Mr. Karsten Stan, David Sheffer, Robert Raid, and Kimberly Pross. So thank you very much. It's going to be at the room right across. Thank you.